Hello and welcome to today's devotion. We are still in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and uh, focusing on the resurrection. And um, last time we we did a little bit of a review, um, and today I'd like to do a little bit of a review as well. Um, let's pray and we'll get into it. Father, thank you for your word and for your truth. And as we go into your word today, please open our minds and hearts to be able to know and to see and to hear and to realize that your word is true and that we can build our lives on it and experience your eternal living, experience the reality of your love for us, your promises and the truth of your promises, experience the glory that's found in your presence. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So, as we did a little bit of a review, we talked about the resurrection being a new reality. It's not like, um, it's, it, it is the greatest promise, it is the greatest revelation that has been given to humankind. Because it defines, if you will, the last act of this play. And what happens when the curtain will be drawn? It reveals that to us. Of all of Jesus' miracles, and there were many as you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, John says there were so many there wouldn't be enough books to be able to write down all of the things that he did. But of all of the miracles that he did, they took place within the context of what this world normally can be experienced by. Meaning, yeah, he walked on water and that's a miracle in and of itself that no one else can do. But you can somewhat wrap your mind around it, meaning you could see it. We, we're, we're familiar with water. We're familiar with working, uh, walking rather, we're familiar with gravity. And it, although it defies that, we have somewhat of a familiarity with it. We have somewhat of a familiarity when somebody gets healed, whether that's supernaturally or God working through the natural way of, of the laws of this, of this world in our bodies. But when it comes to the re resurrection, it is completely otherworldly. There's nothing like it. There's never been in our experience a time where we have a friend of ours in the same way that the first disciples did die and come back in such a way that we can be sharing a meal one moment and then the next moment he's just gone. Or we have a friend in which we hung out with very intimately and very closely and gave our loyalty and faithfulness to as a spiritual leader. Seen this spiritual leader die in front of us, come back, and then not recognize him. Even though we've spent three and a half years with him. It's too otherworldly. We've never had the, the, that experience that the first disciples did. It was so otherworldly that they were in disbelief. There were no creeds to it. There were no doctrines to it. It was something that they were experienced that they had no place to categorically put it in. They didn't have a category for this. They understood the resurrection in the last day that God would come and, and through the prophet Daniel and other prophets, that he would recreate the world and there would be a new Jerusalem, et cetera. But this was one person, not the whole creation. And so it, it, there was no place for their minds to be able to, to put Jesus in some kind of idea or thought or paradigm, if you will. And so... It, take, it, it took time for them to understand what it meant and to, to allow the Holy Spirit to take what they knew 
and expand it so that they knew something even greater. They went, if you will, from knowing about the resurrection to experiencing the resurrection. And that's what I'd like to talk about today is that um, uh, when, we're, when we're reading the scriptures, I'd like to start with verse 44. He told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. These are it. That everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. That's all verse 44. Then verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. So what Jesus is doing is what he does with all of his disciples. He gives them a teaching. First of all, he reveals himself in a way that they are able to relate to. He, in other words, he meets us where we are. Always important to understand. This is the profound love of God through Christ. He always meets us where we are. And he reveals himself as he meets us where we are in ways that in some ways are a process, in some ways are a journey. So for Peter, for example, he met Peter where he was. He was a fisherman. That's what his trade was. That's what his income was. That's what his life was. He met him where he was, at the shore. Not the first time, because Peter was there when Jesus was when John was baptizing, but he met him where he was. He met Matthew at the tax collector's booth. He met Mary Magdalene where she was. That's one of the things that they accused him of, that he eats with sinners. What he was doing is he was meeting people where they were and then taking that relationship from where they were and revealing who he was to them over time, over experiences. And this is what he does with us today. When we read the scriptures, we can read through a gospel, say Mark, for example, in yeah, a couple hours time. And we can read about his birth. We can read, well, not Mark per se, but if you read Luke or Matthew, but if you're just even just reading Mark, you can read about his baptism. You can read about his temptation when he went into the wilderness for 40 days. You can read about his early ministries. You can read about his disciples. You can read about his teachings. You can read about his miracles. You can read about his death. You can read about his resurrection. You can all do that all in two hours, but that doesn't mean that you know him. He will meet you where you are. Because where you are is your reality. God is not abstract. God is not mythical. God is not distant. He is other than who we are because he's not human. And he lives in a, a reality that's far beyond the limitations of ours because God can dwell in the human domain, the physical domain. He can dwell in the, one of the three heavens. He is, dwells in the universe. We cannot. But he meets us where we are. He reveals himself to us by way of showing us something or teaching us something. And then will lead us through an experience so that it's not just knowing about him or not just becoming familiar with his teachings, but it is knowing his teachings and knowing that they are true because of what we've experienced. I just had just the other day, a couple days ago, a dream. 
And very seldom has God spoken to me in dreams. He does, but, but not that often. And it was a simple dream. It was just where I was. It wasn't anything, you know, that I'm going to write down the gospel of, of Steve or the revelation of Steve. Nah, none of that. It was just where I was. It was a very practical dream. But he gave me a dream. Now, the enemy will, can, can, can come into to my dreams and tries to come into my dreams. And, well, we call them nightmares. And try to stir up fear, worry, anxiety, etc. But... As we read in the prophet Joel, in those last days, I'll pour out my spirit. Your old men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. And so it's not uncommon. And when he revealed this dream to me, I didn't know what it really meant. It wasn't that big of a deal to me, actually. But in the next day or two, I found myself in the circ circumstance where I remembered, oh, I just had a dream about that. And so I followed through on what my dream showed me, and it was, it was a, an enjoyable experience. And it wasn't this aha moment. It wasn't really all that religious. It was very practical. God meets us where we are. In addition to being supernatural. And this is what Jesus has done his entire ministry is, re, is meet people where they are and begin to draw them closer to him. And in so doing, he begins to expand their mind and to teach them about a new reality and then gives them the experience of that new reality so that it's not just some abstract spiritual teaching, but it becomes... Something that we know. Something that we are convicted in. Faith, as the book of Hebrews says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The assurance of it. Not wishful thinking. It may start out as wishful thinking, but God will give us in the most perfect circumstances situation and experiences in which we begin to not only understand the truth, but perceive it and recognize it and realize it. It's like the dream I had the other day. I didn't even know really what it was. It didn't seem to be all that significant. But when it took place and it manifested itself, I realized it. I lived it. I physically experienced it and it was a validation and God will continue to do that throughout our toll lives to give us validation after validation this is what he's doing in chapter 24 he repeats what he has spoken and they already knew when you take a look at Verse 44, these are the words I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He already had told them that, but they didn't realize it. They knew it. They knew about it, but they did not know it. Know it. It's very similar to a courtroom situation. If you have a witness that comes on the stand, and Jesus is a witness of his own um, ministry. In fact, that's some of the things that the Pharisees accused him of. You're your own witness. You need to have more witnesses. And Jesus says, well, John the Baptist is a witness. My father is a witness. But it's, it's very similar to a courtroom. You have a witness come forward, and that, whiz, that witness bears testimony. They know it because they experienced it. It's not something that they were taught. It's not something that somebody told them. It was their experience. Now, once they share that experience, the people that hear it have to determine if it's true or not, or if they can trust it or not, or if they have conviction or not. But the person that was on the stand has the authority or is on that stand because they have conviction. They know it. If they don't know it, they won't be on the stand. And it's the same spiritually with us. 
We know that God is faithful, but we don't know if he's truly faithful until he he brings us through something in which we have to trust in him and he proves himself. This is the way that God has been dealing with his people throughout all of history, beginning with the Israelites. Once they were out of Egypt, he makes them double back and go between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea just so that he can prove that he is powerful and faithful and protective. Otherwise, the Israelites may know that, but they may not know it to the extent and with the certainty that they know it after they go through the Red Sea. Well, my friends in Christ, next time we will pick it up. I believe um, the last few verses, starting with verse 50, the ascension of Jesus, and then we'll go into the book of Acts. Until then, may the peace of God be with you. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. 